Welcome. It has just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 2nd of June. And you are watching episode 9 of Regional Rat. Regional Rat, providing an insight to the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and joining me on this episode are my guests, David Catch, Karakach Arlo. I'm sorry, David, for <laughs> mispronouncing, but you can uh, give me a whack later. And Neil Green. Good evening, Bill. Now, uh, David is currently a director of Queensland's Seafood Industry Association, and Neil is a former president of the Queensland Seafood Industry Association. David has been in the fishing industry for about 45 years, both catching and marketing fish. He is presently the director of Macquart Reef Fishery Supplies, which is founded in 1986, and NT Fish, which, has, which was started in the late 90s. David has been the, in a chair position of the Trader Processor in Darwin, and is the current director of Queensland Seafood Industry Association Queensland, and has spent many years lobbying politicians and the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries about the wrong they are doing to the fishery industry. Neil is a fisherman and has about 44 years experience in the Burdekin district. During this time, he has focused on inshore net, crab and reef line fishing, as well as owning and running his own seafood wholesale business and retail shop in air. Neil has set up on multiple fishing industry working groups and committees and was the president of the Queensland Seafood Association. He led numerous industry delegations to federal and state ministers, and he has also won numerous awards for his environmental and industry achievements. Good evening, gentlemen. If Good I can start Bill. with you, David. David Caracciolo, it is, Bill. Caracciolo. Is that better? <laughs> <laughs> Caracciolo. All right, thanks very much, and apologies for that. Uh, we Anglo-Saxons need a few lessons in uh, other dialects. That's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if I can start with you, David, and just give us a bit of rundown. Uh, I've given a bit of brief history of your past and that, but if you can just give us a bit of an insight uh, in regards to a bit of your life story and where you were born and, uh, and your younger years and uh, maybe some of the misadventures you got up to and why you went into fishing. Yeah, Bill, um... Um, I probably bought my first boat when I was 18, which was about 40, 40 something years ago. Um, and but all the way through my childhood, um, you know, we used to go camping at an island of Shoal Point called Green Island. We grew up on the beach. Um, I always had a net in the boat. Um, I think the first, it very first started when I bought my first bait net, or my grandmother gave it to me for Christmas, a 17 yard bait net. And back in them days, um, you know, I was dragging the beaches for potty mullet and all that sort of stuff. And I used to bag them up in pound bags and put them in the deep freeze under the house and have bait for sale sign out. So it probably started from there and um, <clears throat> progressed into, um, you know, net fishing the areas around there, selling the fish locally. Um, I got my fishing license, I think, when I was about 15 or 16 something in, in that area. Um, and as I said, I bought my first boat when I was 18 with a, a dear old local fisherman by the name of Albert Horton. Um, it was only a 25 foot steel boat with a four cylinder diesel motor and a 1500 kilo freezer. Um, and from there, it just sort of, it went. I um, had that boat, sold it, bought other boats. I had three boats going at, at one stage out the reef, working the reef. I was traditionally a, a barrel coastal fisherman uh, barramundi, salmon, that type of stuff, and just loved the lifestyle, loved being out in the water, um, you know, you, you work hard, you, you catch fish, you bring it in, you sell it, it was quite a simple lifestyle, it wasn't complicated, school wasn't a big thing on my agenda, um, I went to school, but, um, you know, education wasn't, uh, wasn't a high priority, I didn't think you need to do all them square roots and that algebra and all that sort of stuff to to survive as long as you can add up and subtract you were, you were and multiply you were pretty right uh, with pounds and, and dollars and cents so um and then i got into marketing by accident um i was i was net fishing and uh, a lot of the fish that i was catching wasn't what the local market wanted small queen fish different things um 
back in them days, people sort of didn't really take to the lesser grade fish. So I started sending my fish to a private bloke in Haymarket in Sydney, um, an Asian gentleman that run like a Paddy's Market type scenario. And then from there, it just sort of went on where um, the Queensland Fish Board decided to, to get out of marketing. We formed a co-op. Um, the co-op didn't last um, too long. It sort of had, had issues. And then I, a couple of reef fishermen come to me and it sort of went from there. And um, then I got involved in the food service and that was in 86. Um, and I'm still here. <laughs> Darwin, just, we ventured just, into just, Darwin just. in the late nineties. Um, and that was mainly by accident, but it wasn't a plan, but I went up there and seen that it was uh, like the last frontier and the way they were doing things, it was just, uh, you know, we could do them a lot better, could, could guarantee the fishermen security, unload them, get them on a truck, get them to market, fishermen get paid. Uh, we bought and sold the fish instead of relying on auctions and different things. And we put a bit of, um, I suppose, uh, um, uniformity into into what we were doing and, and what fishermen were doing so um then i suppose this would probably start in the 70s the 80s the the fight for the coastal fishing has just been rolling on and on and on and on and it's just one thing after the other if it's not net free zones and um quotas and um, TACs and weekend closures and whatever, whatever. And Neil will elaborate probably more on that because he's been more involved in the internals. But it's it's been one constant fight for about the last twenty years. I would say, Neil, would you not agree? Definitely has. Yeah, it's it's certainly uh, ramped up in the last twenty years. Just yeah. in regards to David, you're starting off in business. Um, do you think the capital risks was frightening in those days or do you think uh, the capital risk uh, was sort of worthwhile, like you could, could see an, a good outcome if, if you took certain risks and, and invested capital in fishing? And has that sort of changed to a degree where you wouldn't advise people to do the same thing as you, you accomplished or try to do what you've accomplished in your lifetime? Oh no, it's, um, there was risk, there's risk in all business. Um, but back then, you know, we had the volumes of product, we had the fishermen, we mainly had the fishermen. That, that's an issue we're, we're dealing with today. You know, a lot of the fishermen just don't want to put up with this juggernaut that's been going for the last 10 or 15 years of just eroding their, their lifestyle, their businesses away. Um, but we, we had, like McKay was the biggest reef fishing port on the coast. We had like 58 reef fishing boats here, a trawl fleet, um, estuary fishermen. Um, the markets were, were good. They're up and down like any market, uh, but people wanted the supply of North Queensland product. They wanted the coral trout, the red throat emperor, the Spanish mackerel, your mud crabs, so on. Um, and they were a big part of menus in the Southern States where we've lost that now because we cannot supply that product, so we've lost our market share. Um, as of today, mate, to, to advise anyone um, to invest a lot of capital into the, the fishing industry, um, I would not. And for the simple fact, not that the fish aren't there, or not that you cannot catch the fish, but you don't know tomorrow whether you're going to be fishing or not fishing, or you're going to have some new political agenda on your plate that's going to um, stop you from producing or close your area down. You know, a, a political lobby group um, lobbying the, the ministers or the, or the state government or the federal government about whatever it might be, whether it's to do with AMS or whether it's to do with you know, WWF, all these people um, that come up with stories that the, the fisheries are in decline, uh, we've got to do something. Well, I don't know where these people get this information from because as fishermen, and some might disagree with me, but I think the resource is in healthy shape. Um, we have our seasonal issues, do with wet season, do with temperature, do with salinity, whatever it might be, which everyone has, farmers have it. You know, everyone that relies on nature has the same issue. But when you're dealing with state governments like we've got at the moment and all the groups that are lobbying them, right, they're just too big, they're too big. They're, I don't know what we do to combat that juggernaut. Okay, we'll just move over to you, Neil. If you can give us a bit of your background and your start and 
and your advice to because <laughs> it was just interesting that your daughter was in the background and you were saying she was interested in, in doing fishing. And after David's uh, little uh, commentary there, uh, I don't suspect that you would be really encouraging her to venture out in that field. Yeah, well, she already has, so, uh, but I'll, t I'll touch on that later. Um, certainly, I started, I left school the day I turned 15. Um, similar to David, uh, it wasn't, school wasn't my um, forte. My uh, dad, I'm a second generation fisherman here and my dad was a fisherman. So I followed along his footsteps and uh, he taught me a lot and taught me how to, how to fish, how to rest areas, how to, how to fish like, uh, like the indigenous did in the past. And that's be able to move around. We fished in one bay, Bowling Green Bay, and we used to move around it and rest areas. Um, and it worked very well for uh, a number of years. First, probably 25 years, it worked good. Um, of course, then come uh, uh, the marine parks and green zones and yellow zones and whatever. And um, yeah, we I certainly lost 99% of the area that I fished then. So I had to change the way I fished and, and diversify. I have done that and it's, and it's worked okay. But you know, back from uh, when I started fishing, I um, ventured up into the Gulf, skipped a barrow boat up there for a couple of years when I was 19. Um, come back here with a uh, pocket full of money and bought a boat and went broke. And, and then, uh, you know, it's not an easy game to uh, succeed in, but just kept going and, uh, you know, eventually got there. It's, uh, I've also, uh, along the way, I was... Um, had trouble marketing different product like David and had trouble marketing uh, mud crabs in particular. And uh, I started uh, started marketing my own interstate and a little bit of export. And then uh, found I didn't have enough product and I ended up setting up a, a business called Green Smuddies and, and uh, ended up buying off about 14 fishermen. And I started off several young fishermen back then that, um, were out there and I could see they had the ability to do it. Um, helped them out, got them going. There's, some of them are still going today, catching crabs and sending them away themselves. And um, I was very happy with to, to see that. And my M always had the attitude that uh, we need the young people in the industry. And uh, like all primary industries, it it's, hasn't been happening, but certainly in uh, my area, there's quite a few young people, um, but they're, the, the, what I'm hearing from them is, you know, they don't know what's going to happen after September this year when the quota comes in because most of them have have leaf fishing licenses simply because there's been investment warnings on buying licenses for several years. So they've sat back, leased licenses, gone out there, have all done well, set themselves up, boats and so on, waiting to invest and uh now the, uh, the quota's coming in and uh, with very little chance of them probably obtaining any of it and, and probably buying a license. So their futures are up in arms. So that's the future of the industry there for me and touched on my daughter before. She's, uh, she's been fishing commercially now for three years. And uh, yeah, it's very difficult uh, times for her, but she's, um, she's going to stick it out and see what happens. I'd just like to uh, catch on to one of your comments from both of you in regards to uh, your marketing of your products. Obviously, uh, especially Dave, you indicated that you caught uh, different species of uh, fish and, and crustaceans sort of didn't have appeal to the local market, but you found markets in uh, southern Australia like uh, Melbourne and Sydney, I presume. You think that the uh, change in in the mix diversity of the culture in Australia has sort of helped out in regards to the variety of um, fish that will be is, uh, seafood that's now acceptable in the restaurants and, and in the general community, whereas say before it was fairly you know, a gummy <laughs> gummy shark and <laughs> and that was yeah that was just basic fish and chips. But now there's such a diversity. In, in the restaurants and that, and uh, even even in our own cooking and that, do you think that sort of opened up the market for different 
different different uh, fish. Oh, it has, Bill. But um, I'm talking when when um, when I was net fishing, like barramundi and king salmon were the two fish that that you could sell commercially. You know, into the southern states or the northern area up into the Philip market. Barramundi was known everywhere, like Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, Perth. It, it had its own name. When I was reef fishing, um, I can recall when I was a, a decky on some of the reef fishing boats, the contractor, we only kept coral trout and red throat emperor. The other fish we didn't keep, the stripy bass, the parrot fish, cod, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, when I was net fishing, fish like, like I'd, I'd barramundi fish at a certain time when the weather and tides, whatever, then I'd go up in the flats and I'd catch things like butter brim, small queen fish, you know, slady brim, um, whatever it might be. And the, the local Australian market didn't need to eat that stuff because they had plenty of coral trout and red-throat emperor and barramundi and king salmon and whiting and brim or flathead. So um, they wouldn't eat the lesser species stuff. So I had to find a market because that, that fish was there. And my firm belief as a fisherman, if you're going to catch it, you sell it. You don't catch it and waste it. You don't, you don't waste a fish. If you can't sell it, you don't go to that area. You don't catch that that product or that resource, you leave it in the water until next time. There's no but good. But all fish is great protein too. I mean, it, we've got to make, we've got to make the best of every resource we've got. That's correct. But you know, I'm talking a few years ago, that wasn't on the agenda a few years ago <laughs> because um, coral trout and red freight were plentiful, barramundi and king salmon were plentiful, which they still are now, but um, they're, they're getting used in a different way. Um, so the lesser quality fish, and there's nothing wrong with these fish, the lesser price fish, I should say, not lesser quality, but lesser price fish. A lot of people, the trevallies, the mackerel, salmon mackerel, um, golden trevally, uh, tea leaf trevally, all this type of stuff that a lot of people didn't eat. The people that knew it ate it, but probably 90% of the, of the Australian public would rather have barramundi and coral trout or red throat emperor because it was so accessible and it was there. Um, you know, I think I'm pretty correct in, in that, um, Neil, aren't I? Yeah, certainly. I think we're a, a multi-cultured country and uh, it has certainly helped us, Bill. Um, the, uh, we'd, be, we'd be lost without the uh, Asians out there. They, they are big buyers of seafood. Um, also, all nationalities, you see your, your niche markets in each one of them, which is um, very um, interesting and very good to see. And what, what's happened is it's pushed the, the price of that product up. So that all that price, is, all that fish now is at a price that we can actually um, put ice on and put it in the ice box, which is uh, thanks to being multicultural, which is, which is um, really good. Yeah, so because I can see it from uh, my parents' uh, background, you know, just being white Anglo-Saxon and, and English background, and it was sausages, mashed potatoes, peas, roast lamb, a piece of fish, and it was usually, uh, the, I think, probably in West Australia, it was uh, flake, which is shark, but you know, that was a sort of acceptable. But we, we had very narrow uh, tastes and very overall fairly poor cooking skills a couple of generations ago. But I think the diversity now, I think even white Australians are sort of being in the kitchen and, they add, and, and they're adding to their cuisine. So hopefully that, that sort of helps. But uh, definitely um, I think the multicultural side of it has added a lot of flavour to our food and a lot of different demands on our, and our, on our food stock. The only, the only sad part about that, Bill, the fish won't be there for them to experience their cooking and their skills because under all these managements and these, these especially the state government that we're, um, we've got in Queensland at the moment and Queensland fisheries, mate, they're locking up the fisheries, they're locking up the resource, so, and we won't have the fishermen to catch it. That's gonna be the other issue. Um, you know, it'd be great for everyone to be able to experience the cooking and, and the different, um, methods with the, with the seafood, but I personally don't think we're going to have it. Um, it's just going to get to the stage where, it, and it is there now, like you're talking about flake, the fishermen won't bring it in now because the recording process with the flake, when they catch a shark in their boat and 
keep in mind these people are in 14 foot tinnies with a 40 or a 60 horsepower motor on the back in the open and it's blowing 20 knots or 30 knots and it's raining and you're jumping up and down like a, a cork in a in a cyclone the government wants you to ring up and tell them how many sharks you got what species they are blah 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 you cannot process that shark at sea you cannot cut its head and its fins off you've got to bring it home whole do it on the land then get rid of all the, the rubbish the mental mental anguish with, with all this and it's not just sharks it's the jewfish the coral trout Mate, it's like we're total criminals it's like we're raping and pillaging the ocean you know we as neil said we farm the ocean that is our farm you don't go out to destroy it because you want to be there and the fishing industry has been going for i don't know 100 years or or whatever so if we would have depleted the stocks and annihilated the stocks it would have happened before now when there was no rules and regulations so you know we're the farmers of the sea so we want it to be there and neil's daughter's coming into it i'd love my kids to come into into fishing um and i i love seeing I've got one bloke in town here dan atherton he's a fourth generation fisherman now that's a pretty fair effort i used to work for his father i knew his grandfather his, his uncle the whole lot of them you know he's still fishing he's the only one out of the lot but that's great fourth generation you know where are you going to see that in the future you're not these regulations are pushing the guys out. You know, we have politicians that get involved and put things in place without consulting industry, without even doing any research on the resource. The TAC on the Jewfish in Queensland is one that's really got my goat. And I'll show you a picture here. If you can make that out, that's 32 Jewfish that had to be dumped over the side. The fishermen went to catch another species of fish and accidentally caught them, right? but he had to dump them because the TAC had reached its limit of 20 ton in Queensland. Now there's probably nearly the guts of 15,000 or $10,000 worth of fish there. How can you have a management system in place when you waste the resource like that, right? And he didn't mean to catch them. As I said, it was an accident. Why isn't there some mechanism where he shouldn't ring up or, or do whatever you got to do and say, I've got an incidental catch be allowed to bring that in, right, and sell it, let it get utilised. But no, and with this fishery, these guys are calling themselves managers, these Queensland fisheries, they open this, when they open this fishery, it's right in the middle of their breeding season. We've brought it to their attention, we've had Channel 7 take pictures of the row, we've had everyone there. How can you manage a fishery when you're opening them right in the middle when they're having babies? Yeah. How, tell me how that's a management. That's mismanagement in my books and Queensland Fisheries should be held accountable and taken to task on it. In regards to that, I mean, e even if uh, you do accidentally catch the fish, you know, like you say, there should be a mechanism, even if, say, a third of the value of the fish has to go to the government sort of thing, or it's or better than just, just, it's just better than throwing all that protein into the sea, you know? <laughs> because of paper regulations. <laughs> Not to do with the resource. And remember, this is not just a commercial. I listen to um, recreational or call recreational fishing uh, shows on the ABC on a Friday. They also got the same issue. They go out to fish overnight. Now you're pulling these fish out of 60 foot of water or 80 foot of water. When they get to the surface, they're buggered. Their airbags put, is blowing. They can't go back down. They just become shark food. Now there's no problem with the resource. And this was done with no no um, study of the resource or the fishery and the director of fisheries then admitted on channel seven that it was done with no research it was just a knee-jerk reaction to politics that's all it was so how can you manage an industry on politics it's, there's also the feeling in regards to we can have a well-managed resource and industry with more sensible control but the, but the situation, what they're doing is sort of making it harder for you to stay in the industry and to and to get uh, Australian fish for Australian people and making us more dependent of overseas catches or maybe less well-managed fisheries and less sustainable fisheries. It's It seems to be counterproductive. If you shut down... It's like our timber industry. You shut down the timber industry in Australia, which which we can manage properly and we have regulations and things like that. 
we cut it down and then what we do is import timber and it comes from you know <laughs> endangered rainforests in yeah. indonesia and malaysia it's it's ridiculous but i think that is environmentally right if if um Neil can just cut in here and give us a bit of an idea about the explosion of paperwork and regulation because I know with the farmers between the Vegetation Management Act and the rules coming there and now the um, brief regulations uh, changes to uh, and effects on agriculture and the intrusion, the intrusion into your daily lives in regards to having to fill out volumes of paperwork What's, what's the situation and how much with you and how much has it changed over years in regards to just managing the paperwork side of it? Well, it's, um, look, I think the paperwork started off with the right intent. Um, we need accurate data. So we, we didn't mind writing down our catch data and, and submitting it. So that was all fine, but it's just gone absolutely overboard. Uh, if I could just give you a demonstration, I'm about to go to the reef um, early in the morning. So before I go, we've got to sort of uh, notify fisheries that um, we are going, even though we've got vessel monitoring uh, devices on our boat, VMSs that, that tell them where we are at all times. We've got to let them know that. We've got to go out, I'll fish through till about midnight or whenever tomorrow night. I've then got to get, well, I don't do it, my daughter does, but We've got to write down every fish that we've caught, four hussars, six of these, 10 of that, and so on. So that's got to be done by midnight. It's that paperwork out there, doesn't matter how rough it is, how wet it is, whatever, we're out there and very tired. We've got to fill that in. If we have to, if fisheries happen to come along next morning, daylight, pull up, we haven't filled that out, we're fine. Then um, we finished the trip, say, two days later. We're, we've done all that paperwork. We're coming in, we'll be, we've got to give an hour's notice before we can leave the landing, um, even though they can follow us on VMS. So in we come, we've got to ring up, we've got to sit there on our phones and go through every species on how many we have on board. If we can be out there risking our lives as far as it could be a metre and a half sea running. And we've got to try and ring in and let them know that try and limit the time we're going to be at the landing because the sand flies, mosquitoes are going to eat us. We'll get to the landing. Normally we'll have a half an hour to wait. So we'll sit there in that environment and, and wait and see if anyone wants to turn up to count the fish, um, which is just a joke. There's no need for all that. And then when we get home, we'll unload the fish. We will weigh that fish. Then we will send it to market. We need to ring back to Brisbane, tell them exactly the weights that we've just sent away, verify the numbers, find another log book, which is uh, a catch disposable book, fill that out with all that paperwork and we need to have that done, sent to them and they need to relieve, receive that within seven days. And Australia Post, if we come in on a Friday, there's no way we're gonna get it to them within seven days with a weekend there with um, not being able to post till Monday. Then we get the phone calls or the text why you haven't done it. Then you get the, the, uh, the threats. Well, look, you're going to be fined if this is not put through. What a joke. Can I, can I just, I, I'm just wondering why they haven't bothered to fit you with ankle bracelets. Well, I, I'm pretty sure we <laughs> I mean, a VMS is very similar. So we can't go anywhere. I, my boat goes to fuel up. They know that I'm at the service station. And yet they still require all this information. And as I've said, uh, September, we've got to ring up and tell them we're going to see when they can see it on the VMS. You know, this all comes back to this, this review is happening. We haven't had any face-to-face -face consultation. It's caused a lot of angst to industry along the coast. These sorts of issues that we can see are going to crop up come September. We could have these ironed out by face-to-face, -face, sit down and say, okay, these are the issues. This is not going to work. This whole rollout of quota is not going to work in its current format. And, uh, you know, that's going to come back onto the, onto the fishermen and we're going to have fishing inspectors crawling all over us. Uh, and, and I don't really think uh, people are uh, mentally 
equipped to be able to, to cop this any more of this. I mean, we're all suffering from uh, mental bloomin' fatigue and, uh, you know, it's affecting a lot of people in this industry. And, and I hope Fisheries Queensland are very pleased with that because uh, that's where they've got us. And look, if we look at the big picture here, Bill, this, this is about, this government is full of, okay, we'll throw heaps of money at aquaculture, we'll start growing our fish. We'll import the fish, that's fine. You know, I just hear now that they're, they're looking to throw some money into Pumpkinhead or, or um, Nutcracker Trevally. They're looking at farming them. So they're a good white fish, they're saying. I've heard the minister say it on the radio. And, uh, you know, it's the sort of fish that they're going to try and farm to take, take the place of Spanish mackerel that's used in all our fish and chip shops from... from uh, Rockhampton through to Cairns. These sorts of things are they going to do? And this is nothing new. I mean, they bought cobia out as an aquaculture fish. It was the, going to be the best thing out there. Well, it, from what I've seen, the farms have fallen over growing that. And if if I went back, back to when I was um, president, which um, was a lot of years ago now, I can remember Henry Palaszczuk, who just happens to be the, the Premier's father, um, saying that he was going to um, stop the take of barramundi cod and marry ras and uh, at the same press conference that he made that he was also throwing money into growing uh, barramundi cod uh, in aquaculture well that never worked and here we are at a <coughs> review where they've told us well we might look at that barramundi cod and that marry ras which is good fish we catch it out there it, it blows up from deep water we watch it float out the back of the boat uh, it's very hard to, to, um, to, to release the, the air out of them and the sharks come and eat them. I mean, what a waste of, of a top quality fish. And we've got a review, but we don't want to look at anything from the past. And I just feel that this, uh, this government uh, has got an agenda and Fisheries Queensland is working to that agenda and it is completely against um, commercial fishermen existing for the future. I don't think it's just that. I think it's all primary industry. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's got to a situation where um, they've got academics and universally trained people who have never been on never been on the land, never been to sea, making these decisions. You know, they've been taught by some professor at university who's got a theory about about some sort of agricultural things or whatever, and that and then they become. Um, well, like like in ag force and that they become uh, communications people and things like that, and, it, and it's the same same in the in George Street. You know, these, these people haven't had any real life experience. Is, is, does there need to be a cultural change in regards to departments that are looking after Pacific industry needs to have a certain quota of people who have actually been in the industry and and actually can give real life scenarios to these people. Because I came across this sort of problem back in the eighties when I had a friend who was uh, in the, you, their family for, for a couple of generations have been dredging the Gol Goulburn River in Victoria, making the uh, aggregate out of it. And all of a sudden it, there was a brainwave in, in Melbourne about dredging rivers, you know, it's harmful to the little fishies in regards to their breeding patterns and things like that. And so they put in, a pl in place a, a moratorium and then a complete ban. But, I mean, anyone who knows anything about rivers in Australia, you just have to go to it and you see all these billy bongs. And that's from changes of courses of rivers. And that's because rivers get blocked up. If you don't, if you want the banks to stay in place where they are, you need to dredge the middle of the river. So the flow goes down the middle, it's slow on, slow on the banks, and that's where the fish get to breed. But these people came out and they just completely devastated that industry. And it seems to have been going on for 30 or 40 years now. It doesn't matter what industry, primary industry you're in, it's seem to have this fixation of put it morally buttering it up. Just on another point there, Bill, before I was talking about the management of, of the resource and the fishery, 
we are the only sector or the only stakeholders that record any information of what is happening in the ocean. Now, Mr. Um, oh, just, what's, uh, Ferner, not long ago, stated there was 960,000 or nearly a million um, pleasure recreational fishermen in Queensland. And none of them record any of their, of their catches, their data. And we've asked the managers many times, how can you manage a resource on one sector? You've got the charter sector, you've got the rec sector, you've got the indigenous sector. There may be a couple others there, I don't know, but everyone is taking, and okay, there's bag limits in place, but we all know about bag limits. Um, now, even if the bag limits are adhered to, and they catch five of this and four of that, whatever, you're talking, and if only half of those fishermen go to 960,000, 450, you know how many tons of fish that are coming out that they don't know about? So how can they manage anything with no information, no data? You know, as I said to you, the, the, the Jewfish one, 20 tonne TAC for Queensland. You stated in the opening of the meeting, Queensland coast was 6,000 kilometres. Yeah, six um, nine. Sorry, six thousand nine hundred. Nine nine hundred. We got twenty ton for the whole of Queensland. The Northern Territory got one hundred and forty ton, right? Jewfish quota. How how can you do that to one sector when and these Jewfish have got a nickname, the cockroach of the ocean. They're everywhere, all through the Indo Pacific, everywhere, right around to, to uh, northwestern Australia. I'm only harping on the Jewfish because. Mate, it's just totally criminal what they've done there. Um, but the whole the whole resource, we're the only ones that record any information. The Barramundi sector, the reef sector, the prawn sector, nobody else does. So how how can you get any any data, any research, and put a management plan in place when you've got a scenario like that? It's Queensland Fisheries they should have a vote of no confidence and be booted out and somebody else brought in and the Prime Minister's Minister should go with them because he's responsible. But the thing is, you're an easy target. You've got an ABN, you've got a fixed address, you've got a registered boat, you're also tracked to the nth degree. So it's easy to, easy to pick on you. It's like a farmer on the land. He's got a plot of land, he's got an ABN, he's got a company, and the thing is, they're an easy target because they're all, they just, they're fixed. Like they're fixed in the government site. So that's the problem, whereas, the recreational fishes are all over the place from you know, different days, different volumes and that. Just in regards to regional uh, recreational fishing, is there starting to be a conflict or was there a conflict or are you, are you sort of falling, sort of seeing uh, some uniting in commercial and, and regional uh, recreational fishes? Um. I think that there was a conflict and it started back in the sunfish days. Um, you know, that sun, we tried to work with sunfish and I think Neil will, will back me up on this. Um, with, the, with some of these things coming into place, sunfish wouldn't have a, a bar of the commercial sector um, until something affected them, then they, they come to us. But from what information I'm getting from land-based fishing fishermen, like the conflict is very rife. You know, the, the way that the fishermen are getting treated and spoken to, um, out, out in the, on the grounds is not very good. And, you know, something's going to happen at some stage. So, you know, we also forgot to mention that in these regional areas, we contribute to the economy. You know, the fishermen are buying fuel, they're buying food, they're buying ice, they're buying grease, they're spending money on their gear, they're employing people without these small businesses in these regional areas. And don't forget, these were regional areas 10 and 20 years ago. There wasn't that much happening here. So any industry, farming, fishing, mate, was welcome to employ people and put money into the economy. Now, okay, the mining sector's there, and I've got nothing against the mining sector, but because of these, these industries that have developed and the four day on and five days off, whatever it is, the roster, the seven on, seven off, you've got a lot more people in the ocean. And I'm not here to try and stop guys from going fishing at all, but I want a fair break for our blokes and I want them to understand that we're not out there raping and pillaging the ocean and the rules and regulations and the rubbish that's been put on us by the state government. Um, one thing that Neil didn't touch on if this quota comes in, you have to report to certain landing areas for the government to report your catch. Now, 
We are in regional Queensland. I'm in central Queensland. We've got St. Lawrence, um, Shellwater Bay, Thirsty Sounds, Cape Palmerston. There's not, there's a boat ramp here, there and everywhere. Some of them fishermen live in the mangroves, but they don't touch land at a designating landing spot. So how are they gonna practically manage all this? And if you don't come in, it's a fine. If you don't come into spot A, it's an infringement. You know, not this right, is that. all just, this is rubbish that, as Neil said, we could be working through. The minister won't come and meet with us. Nobody will talk, and that, they're not interested in what we've got to say personally. That's my personal opinion. Neil might have a, a different view on it, but, you know, it's just wrong. It's criminal. And as I said, Queensland fisheries should be disbanded. They should be pulled apart, inquiry into them, and the minister should be made to resign. But those sort of things also affect your bottom line. It, make, makes, <laughs> it cuts down on your profitability if you have to travel an extra distance. I mean, it's not cheap running running a running a boat at sea. Say, what about the safety? You're, you're travelling like if it's blowing thirty knots, you're you're travelling an extra twenty or thirty k's or whatever it might be or sixty k's. What about the danger? What about your product getting bounced around like a bloody um, clothes in a spin dryer? You know, there's all these issues. There's it just can't be done and. If it's blowing, you can't go 60 k's to unload in their spot A. You've got to sit there until the weather drops out. Now, whether that's going to be a week, three days, whatever, your crabs are going to be dying, your ice is going to be, you know, it just it goes on and on and on. It's just totally ridiculous, unpractical and criminal. Regards to you, Neil, in regards to your um, crabbing and that, is there additional problems placed on 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 that activity as well? Exactly what Dave's just touched on. I mean, we've been uh, um, negotiating or, or lobbying government or the fisheries to try and open up other landing spots, but they're pretty stubborn as far as if you land a crab in a, in a private landing spot or a fish for that matter, you're not allowed to. You're gonna have to go out risk your life, go outside if you've got to travel 30 k's to a landing that they can get to, um, then that's going to be how it is. But this is how we fished, you know, forever and a day. I can't see why it's got to change now. And, and Bill, just going back there a little bit to what you were saying about having people in there that know what they're talking about in George Street. I mean, that you hit the nail on the head. I mean, our intellectual knowledge is not valued by these people because they've been to university and we haven't. All we've done is spent seven days a week out there on the water looking and learning what the fish do and, and how that we can catch them and look after them for the future because without product out there, uh, our investment is worthless. The, but if you try and tell that to these people in George Street, no, they, they won't have a bar of it because you haven't got some letters behind your name. So, you know, I just think, as Dave's saying, look, these people have got no idea what they're doing. Um, they're not trying to gather the data uh, from all sectors. And what's happening here is they're going to manage everything through the commercial sector. So as soon as they think, oh, there's a problem with mud crabs, we'll drop the, the allocation or the unit value of mud crabs down for the future, and we won't be able to catch them. Um, what the big loser out of all of this review is the consuming public of Queensland because their rights have been taken from them right here and now by not allowing us to go out and catch fish on their behalf and supply them. And there's six million of those consumers in Queensland. And the sooner they wake up that this is what's happening and they're going to lose, um, you know, it's always the commercial fisher. Why should they catch this fish? But Fish management, other sectors don't value the consumer that we fish on their behalf. And, you know, it shouldn't be that there's 200 fishermen out there uh, catching 10 tonne of product. It should be that there's 6,000 consumers of Queensland that are eating 10 tonne of product. And why aren't they considered when these things are made, uh, these sort of regulations are made? I just see it as this is a way to get rid of commercial fishing and we'll, we'll get aquaculture, we'll get imported fish and the general public won't worry about it. But I got a message for the government. I think they will. 
and I think it'll be reflected in the in the polls and the, at the next election. And all primary industry seems to be being hammered, and that's simply because this government's not supportive of any primary industry. They do not want to to eat the product that we produce, and uh, it is a very sad state of affairs. Just touching on that, I mean, although you, you were sort of picking on the sort of current government, but I think one of the problems is that the bureaucracy has been so infiltrated by a certain mindset. Even if you change the government to another party, you've still got this ingrained bureaucracy and, and its mindset they'll have to deal with an and depending how long an alternate government stays in power, whether they can uh, root that out and make it a bit more amenable is, you know, would we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. But one of the things I'm interested in sort of thing, I, I just look at, at Australia, it's, it's a great big island. It's got, you know, I think nearly 20,000 kilometres of coastline or more. It's it's set, set between the Pacific Ocean and the, and, and the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean. And the Southern Hemisphere is more sea than it is land. So obviously we... Southern Hemisphere would have a great deal of food stock and considering the population of the Southern Hem Hemisphere is probably mm, less than a quarter of the total population of the, of the, of the world. So you go to the Norman, Northern Hemisphere, it's, it's got the Atlantic, North and North Pacific, but you've got volumes of countries, you've got the, all the Europeans, you've got the US on both coasts, you've got the As Asian coast, Huge populations, huge fishing fleets, huge, huge fishing, and historic. You know, like everyone's heard of the Grand Banks fisheries and and the North Sea and all those sort of things. I mean, you look at the North Sea, you've got the Norwegians, you've got the Swedish, you've got the Scotch, you've got the English, uh, all the French, all all on it. So they must be more intense or more intensive fishing in those sort of areas. But I presume they have their problems. But considering we had such a vast ocean around us, why should we? You know, why is it, why do, do we have this sort of mindset? That we're 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 completely draining the resources. You know, a nation of twenty five million people with probably I don't know how many fishing licenses there is, maybe a thousand fishing licenses. Yet we're going to devastate the planet in regards to our, our take. Well, that's what, we're the third uh, biggest water mass in the world I'm led to believe, and we're probably the smallest fishing industry. And, and some of our practices are still back when Noah you know, rode his boat around. Um, but when you say about this, there's a lot of things that, that happen are brought in from other countries, like our Coral Sea closure was instigated by the Pew Foundation, an American foundation who I'm led to believe is an offshoot of some oil barons to take pressure off themselves. This is what we're doing around the world. Why are they picking on us? Why did our government bow to them? We should have told them to go back home and do their own stuff. But, you know, as I said, we've got the third biggest water mass, I'm led to believe, and we've got the smallest fishing fleet. I know a few years ago, um, before all the illegals um, got out of Indonesia, when the new government came in, there was like 7,000 registered fishermen that, that the government had on their books without the, the illegals, the Taiwanese and the these ones and the that ones, you know, and they're, they're still supporting an industry. Um, and we've got minimal, as I said, I think we'd be lucky if we'd have a couple of thousand fishermen around the whole country, um, you know, 50 boats in the Gulf, a couple of hundred in the Queensland coast, uh, Western Australia. I don't know if we get to 2000, but, um, and all the management regimes we got in place to protected areas, just more and more and more of this political rubbish that's all it is it's it's all politics nothing else it's not not worried about the resource keeping themselves in jobs and making work for themselves that's all they're doing it's my opinion anyway neil look if um if we just took the shark as an example and i had a, a lot to do with the shark fishery when it was uh, reduced in queensland by uh minister garrett who was the federal environment minister at the time and our shark fishery went from 1,100 tonne to 450 tonne. We're seeing the problems with that now, which I uh, did identify back then was going to happen. 
Uh, we've got an explosion of sharks along here that are eating our resource, our, our seafood out there. And they're starting to uh, actually eat people. And I can tell you, when you start, when you leave like 600 tonne of shark in Queensland waters, um, and, they, and you let them grow up year after year, uh, we're going to have a real big issue. Well, I, went to, I went to Canberra. I uh, actually, at the time, spoke with the Prime Minister on this issue because Peter Garrett was absolutely just as green as they come and wasn't interested in, in speaking with us. The, the Prime Minister's office uh, investigated it. I had the science. The science was there. I took it with me and said that we've, we're catching sustainably. We, we've got a great market for it in our uh, supermarkets and whatever. It's a cheap alternative fish to imported fish. Two weeks later, that department come back and said, you've got no chance, Greeny. This is on the world stage. We're saving the sharks of the world because other countries are fishing them to nothing. And here we are now with sharks that, are, that we're not going to put our toe in the water. And this is supposed to be good management. So, you know, everything seems to be, oh, there's something happening overseas. And Queensland seems to be gonna, gonna save it. It's just um, a ridiculous situation. And uh, I hope, um, you know, I hope they can look at, look at that. Well, you would have thought they could look at that and, and learn, but they haven't. They just continue the same practice as they, as they roll out this review. I've seen seen the incidents uh, when there's been fatal shark attacks or a shark attack on the eastern seaboard, and usually the news news gets out there in the helicopters and that they do an aerial view, and the number of sharks you can see in the clear water close to shore, it's horrendous. I mean, surely anyone who ha had a real interest in fisheries and the shark population, you could with drone technology today. You could scan basically the probably the coastal area, at, you know, maybe up to a kilometer out to sea, and and get a pretty good indication of the shark numbers. But sometimes it, it's really frightening just looking at those aerial pictures and the number of sharks around Byron Bay. That seems to be a, a fairly good area for people eating. Our, our shark fishery has been shut down. WWF has done an excellent job by going to the supermarkets and saying that shark's not sustainable. Uh, it's, it's not sustainable in parts of the world, but certainly in Queensland it is. We have a shark fishery out there. If this government was fair income of managing the resource, they would be opening that shark fishery up, letting commercial fishermen catch it and do something with that shark to save the resource that's being eaten. If, if the recreational guys that go out the reef tell me they lose at least two to one of their reef fish. They'll bag out on trout and bring home 20 trout, but they've lost 40 to sharks. This can't continue. And yet this management want to turn a blind eye to that. What, you know, who are these people? It's, uh, well, you know. Well, I, I just got to have a chuckle there because I think mm. with the situation where you've got an environment minister who was only elected in the first term of office and, and as a minister, God help us, uh, I think uh, Megan Scanlon, I think she's about under 30 years of age, probably hasn't had a real life job uh, doing anything in particular. And she's probably, she's making decisions or she's signing off on decisions, but her head chief of staff is Nick Heath. Now, Nick Heath was the spokesman for WWF he was the president of the Australian Marine Conservation Society. So in regards to agriculture or any primary industry, you cannot think you're going to get a reasonable hearing if that's the sort of people that are sort of operating in those departments. And it's just not, if they're already, you know, got that mindset, an ideology, you might say, it's going to be very difficult to sort of shift them from their planned course. Do you, do you think it's reasonable that a government should stack its um, ministries with, with lobbyists or activists um, 
it's sort of a, got a sway when when really a government should be there to sort of well our job is to grow the economy improve people's lifestyle and and wealth but obviously that doesn't seem to fit in the frame for for at least environmental um ministry wouldn't you think that would hinge on a conflict of interest just just slightly and um and I think on another note, the, we haven't touched on the Spanish mackerel um, working group, but I think, and I could be wrong, Neil might correct me there later, that Nick might be, Nick Heath might be the chairman of, of that now. He took somebody else's position, I think, that got removed in the last meeting, but uh, Neil might know more about that than I do. But on, on another note, with, with the, the flake or the shark, for this year, I would lucky if I would have bought probably 100 kilos of shark trunks in the, the six-month period, where we used to unload you know, a ton or two ton a week, ton and a half, different times of the year. Now, from the market sense, Neil touched on it before about the consumers, but we're struggling as marketers to get product, local product, and enough to supply our markets. Like Red Throat Emperor and Coral Trout, I don't sell to the wholesale market around the McKay area to the restaurants and hotels. I keep it for my own shop because I don't get enough off the boats that are left to supply restaurants and cafes and so on. Flake, as I said, um, a lot of our fish that we're, we're cutting now is coming out of Darwin, from my depot in Darwin. But yet we've got tons of largemouth nanny guy. We've got tons of red throat emperors sitting out there um, to be caught. Nobody wants to catch it. There's no young boys coming through because there's no confidence. The consumers, once again, are missing out. They're coming to the shop looking for this or that. No, we can't get it. We haven't got it. The fishermen aren't catching it. They can't catch it. What about all these land-based businesses like ourselves? Um, you know, we had up to 45 staff here at one stage. I think I've got probably about 10 or 12 now. Um, Townsville, Bowen, uh, Yapoon, Gladstone, all these people employ people right, in the businesses and we supply seafood to the general public. But what about all these people and all these regulations? And it's, it's just about, you know, the last nail in the coffin. It's also with this, with this quotaization. I feel it's going to corporatise it. You know, the mud crab uh, quota will be bought up by interests or, or big of interest, whether they're overseas, local. They will control the supply and the market of it and the pricing. Um, your barramundi, things like that. But middle, you've got to have operators or fishermen to catch it. But how they do that, I'm not sure. We see it happening around the north now with the barramundi fishery in, in the Northern Territory the Spanish mackerel fishery in, in Western Australia, the grey mackerel fishery in the Territory, um, getting bought up by, by bigger groups, investment groups. What their agenda is at the end, you know, whether it's to control, to sell the, the rights, control the market, but they will control the market if um, these smaller guys will eventually, if not straight away, sell because they won't have enough quota to make themselves viable and to buy quota well, are you going to go out and borrow a heap of money to buy it when there's no confidence in the industry when you when you don't know you're going to be allowed to fish there next week? So people like ourselves, you know, will be selling chicken or, or ducks or chips or peas or something because the fish will be a, a thing of the past. So all these land-based businesses and the marketing side will be a thing of the thing of the past. But it's not only that. It's, it, it, or obviously the fisheries and the fishermen's scaled down, but that also packs, packs on some of your, your, your supplying businesses in regards to your, like your fuel retailers, your maintenance, your mechanics, uh, your engineering uh, groups and that in the, in the most regional areas. And, and that's devastating for regional economies. If, if industry, primary, all primary industries, fisheries and grazing and growing, if they don't keep expanding, it's only it's got to impact on those sort of suppliers and the supporting industries, and that's a big danger to all regional centres. I mean, if you if you look at regional Queensland, you can see how it's uh, small towns that further out have tied off over time. If you look at places like um, Richmond, um, Flinders area, and things like that, and I'm sure down down your coastal where. Uh, Longreach and all those inland cities have sort of suffered over time. The thing is, if if regions don't grow, you wither. And as, 
And if you don't grow, even if you just sustain yourself, you lose services. I mean, we've seen with the newspapers and things like that, you've, you've lost your local newspapers because you haven't grown. It's not as though you've, you've shrunk so much. It's just that you haven't grown and you, the scale of economy isn't there. So it's important that your industry and the agricultural and all primary industry grows for the benefit of the region. And the government seems doesn't seem to have a focus on growing or creating more wealth. It just it's just caught up in this cycle of let's produce more regulation because that's our job. I think rather the job is regulation rather than growing the wealth as a state. Interesting you say that. I, I was just. Um talking with the local outboard dealer in town here, I just purchased a 48 outboard off this guy. And uh, we were talking about the future of the industry. And, and he said, look, if this goes down the tube, he said, I'm gonna have to get rid of uh, at least one of my mechanics. He said, because you commercial guys, he said, you're hundred hours, you run it up three to four weeks, you're running hundred hours up on an outboard. He said, so all your outboards are in here being serviced every month. He said, where well, the recreationals might come in once a year. He said, so, you know, the impact to us is not seen by these guys getting rid of us or whatever. So that's just illustrating what you're saying there, Bill. Um, and I, I just make another point. I mean, we're, this quota is going to be brought in by the kilo. So we're going to be managed by the kilo. Recreational fishers are managed by the piece. If these people are managers, you know, you'd think you'd, it'd be uniformed of, of how you measure it. So at the moment, you know, here we are with, uh, we can have a thousand kilos of fish and, and someone else can have a thousand pieces. Why wouldn't you be both the same and have pieces? It just makes too much sense. And th these managers that are out there that are trying to manage this fish haven't learnt that they're not listening to them. You've got to manage people. And to manage people, you've got to be able to consult with them. And that's something that they haven't done. And I'm just of the opinion not going to and they're not going to change it's uh, i think brisbane sort of in a situation where it's just sort of steadfast or well, in lockstep with the, with um groups that have sort of got control within the government uh it doesn't matter whether what sector of agriculture we're in you're not going to get a fair, fair hearing because I've looked at a number of inquiries because we've had people from property rights and we've had people who are uh, different farmers and that going back to the Vegetation Management Act. And you, they do these inquiries, uh, public inquiries, and uh, plan, uh, the Vegetation Management Act uh, amendment was, was classic. I think they had about 20 or 30 public meetings. It took 772 public submissions and not one thing from the original position changed. It, it didn't matter the case made by um, you know, long-time experts in, in um, woodlands management like Bill Burrows and his extensive career. And even and he was even in, uh, in, in the uh, bureaucracy at one time and had plenty of field experience. It took exactly no interest whatsoever. And it seems that they're just intransigent. So I don't know how we're going to get it, get around this situation in regards to Brisbane's the problem and it's bureaucracy's the problem. But we're all hoping that we'll deliver a solution. I think there's something inane in that in that concept. No, no comment. <laughs> not, no, you're, not brave you're, enough. <laughs> you're totally right. Bureaucracy has just run rampant in the last oh, 10, five, five to 15 years. Um, you know, it's just gone, gone totally crazy. And, um, and the thing is, where does it come, as I said before, where does it come from? Does someone stand back and throw a dart, whether it's a koala bear today or a possum tomorrow or a fish or whatever, um, you know, the, the Spanish mackerel trigger points one here. Um, apparently, they were they were uh, mounting around about closing the Spanish mackerel fishery down. Now it's a it's a six hundred ton TAC. We've caught two hundred and fifty ton of it, so there's still you know 
300 a tonne floating around somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure what the recreational take is because there's no monitoring system. But how do they come to a conclusion that it's, it's and they want to keep the fisheries at 20% bio, of the biomass, how do they work out that it's dropped to 17%? Who, who's got the formula? Who done the survey? How did they sur survey it? And, you know, if it, because the fish weren't caught last year, well, a lot of people weren't fishing last year due to what was happening. Um, and a lot of markets weren't open and different things. So how, how did they come to this conclusion that the Spanish mackerel fishery is in, in turmoil when everyone's sort of just gobsmacked? Well, I, I was speaking to a fisherman up here in regards to um, quotas and that, but apparently this, you know, this is you know, not, I don't know if it's factual or not, but he was saying that they're actually looking at, at 1911 um, news clippings in, from the paper in regards to the catches of, of, of boats in those days and, and how the volume they caught in the time they caught and trying to relate it to today. Well, 1911, our seas wouldn't have been even touched and there probably would have been a couple of fishermen. So I presume catch the ability to catch fish would be fairly high whereas they you know with a greater population and more more boats out there you can't can't equate well we should should have this many in the sea because two boats caught this many in this sort of time and that you should be able to extrapolate that it in regards to what we're doing now but <laughs> that seems pretty amazing that they sort of look at things like news clippings or paper clippings from 1911. 1911? 1911. What, what were they rowing a canoe out, going out in a canoe or something, were they? Well, well that, that's what you're saying. He says, you know, how can they use information like that? But apparently you we were saying that that's one of the things that they use it as a data source to, to oh, base things on. So you lost me. <laughs> if, if, you, if you, I mean, one thing about statistics and information, you can cherry pick it to do whatever you want. And that's one of the biggest problems we've got with bureaucracy. They're great at ch cherry picking information and then making sure they omit to say anything about the rest of it sort of thing. So but that's the problem we're sort of up against. Anyway, gentlemen, it's gone um, eight o'clock. I've taken up enough of your time. I'd just like to wrap it up now with any final comments. You first, Neil. Yeah, Bill, well, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. And I'd just like to take this opportunity to uh, apologise to the seafood consuming public of Queensland. I've taken pride in, in producing fish on their behalf for 45 years. And it looks like um, this government and the bureaucracy in fish management is going to take it from them. But And I feel personally responsible that they're going to have to go and uh, source some other products. So. Sorry, consumers. David? Well, I'm, I'm sad for the whole industry, like the young blokes that, that might have been like me, that all they wanted to do was go fishing, um, you know, be out there in the, in the wind and the sand and the, and the whatever, away from all the, the hustle and bustle of, of town that may not, or I don't think we'll have that opportunity. Some may venture into it, but the, the confidence level of the industry or getting into the industry is very low. So um, I don't think that will happen. Um, and as I said, it's gonna be very sad for the consumers because the stuff that, our, that we've had our bread and butter fish, our brim, our mullet, our flathead, our you know, barra, the salmon, all that type of the stuff, and our reef fish, the mackerel, is gonna be either that expensive um, to, to get, or it'll just be, it, you won't get it because if you don't want there to catch it, um, so it's, it's gonna be a very sad thing. It's an industry that's been very good to a lot of people, a lot of communities, a lot of regional areas, um, even a lot of politicians, unfortunately, but um, it's been good to them. And, you know, tourism, where's the tourism industry gonna be? People come up from Melbourne, wanna eat barramundi, coral trout, tiger prawns, banana prawns, mud crabs. You know, they're gonna come up to Queensland and eat what? Whatever, Southern snapper, or, or even if, if there'll be any Southern snapper, but I mean, it's a very sad state of affairs and the, the consuming public aren't aware and I don't know how we get the message across to them to, to let them realise how serious this is 
And, you know, it, it's very serious. It's, it's on the brink of being non-existent in, in my books. And, um, you know, it's sad. And it's, it's sad for a very good industry that's done no harm to anyone. Um, so, yes, it's the politicians don't care. It doesn't affect them. So they're not interested. They're just living their life in George Street and their cafe lattes and keyboard keyboard cowboys that they are and, and their mates. Um, it doesn't affect them. They do a 38 hour a week, go home, sign off on regulations that are totally impractical, that nobody can operate under, no one can work with. But who gives a shit? That doesn't affect them, it only affects us. So once again, thanks for the opportunity, Bill. And I hope uh, the general public see this and, and maybe get some sort of swing together and momentum to, to try and lobby governments and organisations to, to come to their senses. Okay, gentlemen, thanks very much for your uh, time tonight. If you just stay there, I'll just wrap up the show and come back to you. That was episode nine of Regional Wrap. Next week in episode 10, I'll have a spokesman from the Australian uh, Pig and Dog Hunters Association to give us a bit of rundown in regards to their industry uh, the impacts of feral pigs on our agricultural sector and the environment and the job they do free of charge to sort of try to negate some of that damaging impact. So until next week, thanks very much and we'll see you again. Thanks, Bill. Thank you.